This is NICU Babies Parent Support with Katherine Whitaker, a podcast from Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit that provides free personalized support, resources, and community before, during, and after a NICU stay. My conversations here will focus on education and personal stories with medical and hospital professionals, counselors, therapists, and NICU moms and dads from across the country. Whether you're preparing for a NICU stay, you're currently there, or you're months and years past your stay, you belong here. The NICU is hard. We're here to help. I'm your host, Katherine Whitaker, the mom of six children, including my very own NICU baby, and I'm so honored you're here. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the podcast. Happy, as always, that you're here. There are a lot of people that help NICU babies and NICU families And I think some of them we know about. We know about the doctors. We know about the nurses. We know their roles. We see them on a frequent basis. And then there are other specialties in the hospital that you don't know that they exist until you need them. And I think child life is one of those. I should spell that. That's L-I-F-E, child life. I did not know that child life existed. Uh, Certainly, I mean, before we had a NICU baby, I didn't even know that that was a thing. And when we found ourselves in the NICU, I was so surprised and very grateful that when we were in a situation where we really needed some assistance, Child Life showed up. And they have continued to show up for our family, both in doctor's offices, as well as the hospital, whether it was for another surgery or another procedure. And I am indebted to the the things that they taught me how to do as a parent. And I'm finding that those are things that I use to this day. And our preemie is 13 years old, y'all. So I wanted to visit with someone that could give you some tools, some actual actionable tools that you could use right now in the NICU, as well as in future hospital stays. And I have found her and she also has a beautiful presence on social media, which I know will be a gift to you. Katie Taylor is the co-founder and CEO of Child Life On Call, a digital platform designed to provide parents, kids, and the care team with access to child life services, tools, and resources. She's a certified child life specialist with over 12 years of experience working in various pediatric healthcare settings. She's the author of a children's book, and she's presented on the topics of child life and entrepreneurship, psychological care in the hospital. I think that's psychosocial. Let me say that again, psychosocial care in the hospital and supporting caregivers in the NICU setting, both nationally and internationally. She's the creator and host of Child Life On Call podcast, which focuses on the essential role of child life services to empower caregivers at and beyond the bedside. And with an intro that amazing, you know this interview will be good. Let's chat. So Katie, thank you for being here. I have 1 million questions for you, but I'll start with the thing that I think might help people give a better sense of what is child life. Why did you go into, of all the specialties that you could have gone into working with children, why child life? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm such a big fan of Hand to Hold. Um, I live here in the Austin area and worked at the St. David's Children's Hospital um, up in North Austin and got to work really closely with their NICU starting a child life program and got to integrate with uh, Hand to Hold volunteers and just loved every moment of that and think it's so important. So I'm so grateful to be here talking with you. Um, So, you know, I... I knew I always wanted to work with kids. Uh, My mom is actually a child abuse prevention advocate. So my whole life, I have kind of been exposed to this world where um, adults can do things to help kids. And um, I've just been so impressed by her. So I think she really modeled for me that um, I love working with children, but you can do it in a capacity at a larger scale. So I was at Penn State University. Um, I was studying to go into PR and communications and got volunteered with this um, nonprofit called THON, which happens to be the largest largest student-run philanthropy in the world. And um, they raised money for children's um, Hershey in in NPA. So I went to go and I met a child life specialist and I said, you, 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 you're doing the thing that I want to do. Um, So I really got to combine that love of advocacy, awareness, child development, and it just kind of all came together there. I love that. I love that sometimes you see somebody doing something and you're like, how can I do that too? That must have meant that they were doing it with a lot of joy and passion. That's always a plus. Yeah, absolutely. I have yet to meet a child life specialist that, that doesn't carry that around with them. And just, we feel like we have the 
biggest privilege in our role. And it's amazing. Well, you certainly, um, speaking from experience, child life specialists helped us navigate and power through um, some of the darkest days of when we were in the neonatal intensive care unit and certainly subsequent hospital stays. But for someone listening that has no idea what a child life specialist does, why don't you give people an idea of what your expertise is and how you can benefit families? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad to hear that you had a positive experience and that means that that hospital is well equipped with tools and resources. So I always love that. Uh, so really the, the way I like to explain child life is that we are child development experts who are also no um, psychosocial care. So what that does, we integrate the psychosocial care model and trauma-informed care in hospitalizations with our experience with child development. So that can look really different depending on where you are in the hospital um, or where you're exposed to child life. I often say we can literally be in the trauma bay with a family explaining to the parents in the corner what they're seeing and what's happening, what the care team is doing to take care of their child. And 10 minutes later, we can be running bingo in the playroom. So we really kind of run the gamut of, of what that looks like based on where we are and where we're working. In the NICU, it looks like a lot of sibling support, a lot of caregiver support, a lot of helping kind of demystify uh, what the care team is saying into a language and a pace that parents can understand. Um, and that's where I had most of my joy was just falling in love with our NICU program and just feeling so connected to those families. I actually want to dive in. You mentioned something I think is worth exploring is they are often a population that gets underrepresented and they're sort of this we call them sometimes the silent sufferers or the siblings of NICU yeah. babies. So when our son was in the NICU, he was kid number five for us. So I had four other children who were older than him, but all under the age of eight when our son was in the neonatal intensive care unit. And I felt like they got the short end of the stick because yeah. everyone was focused on mom and certainly everyone was focused on baby. Dad was sort of somewhere in there and the siblings sort of got lost. So as a child loss specialist, how can we pay more attention, do a better job of supporting siblings who likely have this very scary thing that's going on, and they may or may not be in a space where they understand what's happening. Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's such, you know, I think the best way to explain it is it sucks because you have to leave one child to go be for there for another child. And then you leave that one and you have to go home. And there's really no winning in either scenario. You feel like you're being pulled in all directions. And so usually what would happen um, with parents is we'd start on a really smaller scale about, um, you know, how is it going when you're leaving the house? You know, when you're leaving the house to come to the NICU, how do your kids respond? And through that, we can kind of get an assessment of how the kids are coping and the question I get a lot is like, what is the best way to, do I just sneak out because that's easier on both of us? Do I, you know, bring them with me or maybe the hospital doesn't allow that? And just so many questions. And my response is always honest, open communication is going to be better in the long run. Um, but there are some rituals you can put in place when you go, when you have to leave your child at home to go see your child in the NICU. And that's something really small, like, will you help me pick out the book that I'm going to read today? Or do you want me to take a picture of what the bathrooms look like and I'll bring it home to you? Or can you color a picture that I'm going to hang then, you know, next to the crib or the isolate? And then you can take a picture of the, the baby in the NICU with the picture that the child has drawn at home. And what that does, it kind of puts the two worlds together for the child because really it's just the unknown. And we know a lot of NICU parents have spent, or NICU moms especially have spent time maybe even in the hospital before baby gets to NICU. So maybe they've been gone for a long time and, yeah. um, you know, so there's just a lot of questions surrounding that. So, you know, think simply, think, um, compassionately and think honestly when you're talking to your kids. Yeah, I think I, as you were talking about, I think we would cry when we leave, left our house because yeah. the kids were crying. And then we were crying when we left the NICU because we didn't want to leave our baby alone. And I felt like I was never winning. So, um, you know, I hadn't thought about that until you mentioned that I did have my kids because our preemie's now 13 years old. I remember thinking maybe we should have him draw or kid, our older ones draw a photo. And I don't think I ever really thought about that connection. I'm glad that you made that connection between the two worlds sort of come together in that place. And it's a reminder that um, they're all still part of the same family. They're just in two different places right now. It's a hard concept, I think, for siblings to fully grasp. 
It's really hard. Yeah. Even taking picture of yourself in a chair and saying, we have chairs at home that we sit in too. Just these really concrete explanations for younger children can help them kind of conceptualize where you go when you leave them, because that's really yeah. their, their world is likely very egocentric. And how is this affecting me? I want my mom with me not my mom with somebody else. Um, so anything you can do to bridge those two worlds together, it doesn't have to be life changing. You know, it can be a simple right. picture or a book to pick out on the way. But every time you leave, you have that ritual that they can connect with. I love that. So I think the very first time that I was introduced to child life was actually during a really stressful, um, so our son was uh, NPO, so he couldn't have nothing by mouth, but they had to do a procedure. And I remember that one of the nurses said, oh, we can give him sweeties. So like we can put stuff on his pacifier and give it to him. And I was like, no, 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 like he can't have anything by mouth. And I sort of panicked because prior to that, when he would have a difficult procedure, I would either nurse him or we would give him something to suck on. And I was freaking out. And I remember looking at my nurse and she said, let me call child life. And I was like, wait, what's that? So, um, and then of course, every time, and these procedures sort of continued, you know, they were painful, they were hard, we needed to do them. But I was also like, surely there is a way that we can make this not so painful for me as the mom, but certainly for the baby. Um, I didn't want my baby to be in pain. So what are some things that a child loss specialist might recommend or do in a situation when you're trying to alleviate pain um, in a variety of circumstances so that the procedure gets taken care of, but the baby and the mom don't suffer? Mm, My gosh. Yes, I feel for you. Those are so, it's so hard because, you know, like when your child is in pain, your baby's in pain, you feel it so much. Um, So there's a couple things. And of course it varies by age. So if we're talking about young, young preemies, micro preemies, or, um, you know, babies who spend time in the NICU at full term or even older kids, um, I don't think it's ever a bad idea to just kind of start narrating in a very soothing, calming voice that you're present there for your child. So what that does is you're not, you're not frantic yourself. It actually helps calm you down if you try to slow your pace. Um, Another thing I really enjoy when parents do, I'm so glad you mentioned sucking um, and advocating for yourself that you can breastfeed during a heel stick. It is possible to keep the baby safe, contained. Um, Or if there's a swaddle that's present and it needs to happen on an arm, you can swaddle the whole rest of the body. Um, You can do a containment hold. So that looks like you're putting your hand at the, the top of your baby's head and a hand at the bottom of baby's feet. Um, We know that sometimes babies, uh, when they're often touched in kind of a rubbing motion, that can actually be painful to them. So just some light tapping. Now, you don't have to remember any of this. You can look at your nurse and you can say, I've lost my marbles. I'm so tired. I know I can do something to help. I don't know what that is. Can you please tell me? Because likely they want you to get engaged, but they're thinking about safety. They're thinking about collecting the specimen that they need, getting their job done. So sometimes we just have to say timeout. And often those timeouts happen when we're checking baby's bracelet, we're confirming the procedure's done. And then you can say, take your parent timeout and say, okay, now what is my role here? And, um, Sometimes we offer white noise. Sometimes we, you know, we can't do much during a procedure. If that does tend to happen, then what are we doing right after to help baby return back to baseline? And what is that after part going to look like? I love that you encourage parents to say, hold on, let's pause for one second. And one, be an advocate for the baby, but also for you to say like, it's okay to take 10 seconds, 30 seconds to say like, all right, we're about to start this. This podcast is produced by Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit, but we're more than simply a podcast. Be sure to download our app, join one of our support groups, or find one-to-one support, enjoy counseling, find loss and bereavement support, participate in a peer-to-peer mentor program, or check out our news, articles, and family stories at handtohold.org. All of that is at no cost to you. Hand to Hold's mission is to provide personalized support before, during, and after a NICU stay to help ensure that all NICU families thrive. There are some babies who, as they're getting ready to go into a procedure or a surgery, and certainly as they get older, and I'm thinking of my older kids, certainly our preemie as he aged up and started to have procedures and he was aware, like, Mm. this is going to be painful or this is going to be stressful. And I don't have the capacity to calmly walk myself through that. So as a parent, as they get older, um, 
how how do you help a child like particularly if it's a recurring thing like i'll use this as an example um our oldest one had to have blood draws and they were on a regular basis and he completely lost his mind and yeah. um how do you see that situation know that it's going to be stressful and how do you march toward helping it be um less painful but also something that maybe not necessarily that they look forward to but that they can kind of calm themselves down how do you get to a place of doing that katie yeah such a good question it, you know and it does start with the parent and your mindset of getting geared up for this and saying this is going to be terrible or it makes sense if this goes really badly we've had this experience this experience mm -hmm. it hurts when you have to get this done so taking the pressure off yourself that your child needs to perform or react in a certain way and then when they do cry we always say crying is coping you're sharing how you feel like of course it's going to come out this way so kind of just letting yourself say you know if this all goes to heck then that makes a lot of sense doesn't it for what we've been through um but secondly it really starts before the procedure happens and i'm going to give you two tools one is preparation and so anytime you can use a preparation and what i would do is include the sequence of events so you know, we're going to have to drive to the hospital or drive to the, the clinic, um, park in a parking spot. We're going to walk in and this is all really common sense, but what you're doing is you're putting the sequence of events together and then the child's able to go, okay, I know we're going to do that. I know, I know I can do that. I know I can get out of the car. Um, but you're just kind of walking them through what to expect. And at each kind of touch point, you can give them a little bit of control and say, well, if we have to sit down in the waiting room, should we be closer to people? Or do you just kind of want to mind your own space? That's something that's super simple that the child can then have, um, you know, just a, a bit of mastery over. And then just be really honest and say, you know, I don't know exactly how this is going to go. The last time I had to do this, the first step was wiping. And I remember that felt cold and wet. The second step was a tourniquet that went on. That's like that rubber band that goes on. You know, the third part was the needle. And that was my least favorite part. But, you know, it only lasted about five seconds. So let's count to five together and see how long that is. Then when it was over, I knew the procedure was over because they put a Band-Aid on. And so that's when I knew it was time to go. So you're kind of walking them through preparing you do want to watch your child's cues. They'll tell you, <laughs> we know our kids, right? And they when they're like, this is not the time, that's okay. You can just say, I can tell you don't want to talk about this right now. Um, it is something that we have to do. So if you do have questions, please come talk to me um, or say, I might bring this up again right before we have to leave just to make sure you know what's happening. Um, and then the second tool I would talk about is that coping plan. And so it's kind of those touch points of how are we going to get through this and what are your choices? Um, when you and I were writing to each other before this, you said, you know, what's um, the best distraction item? And when your child is old enough to tell you what they like, then it becomes their choice and it becomes their preferred distraction. So I'd have kids with frequent blood draws be like, we're watching um, Minecraft on YouTube <laughs> and that's going to yes. be what I do. And that's going to be my choice for younger kids. You know, bubbles really work well, anything that help with the senses. So when you touch a bubble, you feel a little bit of, you know, coldness or, um, you know, a flavored something that they can smell or just a tactile, comfortable blanket. Um, you know, I think any of those things that normally help your child calm down when they're at home, we can bring to the hospital too. Well, that was worth having you on just for that. That was so good, Katie. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, I, I'm, thank you. I'm thinking back through, this is maybe some encouragement to some NICU moms who maybe are in the trenches right now is that as I look back over the last 13 years, my son just had to have a, a medical procedure at the dentist office. And as I'm reflecting on his recent visit, I actually used so many of the things that I learned in the NICU. And I mm -hmm. use it with my other children, too, who never had a NICU stay. But this narration of, remember, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do that. And then it's really about what they can control and what you can't control. I, oh, that was so good. I'll, oh, I'll like know, replay that clip. It's like so... Um, it, it puts like, what can I control in my own body? And then what do I have to relinquish control to someone else? And as they get older, that becomes something that they can handle. But man, so many of the things that I learned in the NICU are benefiting us now that he's um, a teenager. Yeah. Good Gosh, child specialist we had. No, that's amazing because, you know, those skills stay with you and they'll stay with your child too. So as they grow up and they continue in this healthcare journey that we all have forever and ever, they're going to be able to follow what you've already put in. So that's amazing. Well, I'll credit my good 
child life specialists. They modeled well, <laughs> and I guess I was paying attention and didn't even realize it. So I know that you were in child life specialty for a very long time, and then you started this great um, website and this resource for parents. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Child Life on Call? Yeah, thanks. Um, so Child Life on Call really started as a podcast about uh, six or seven years ago, really looking for parents to feel less isolated by their child's illness, a lot like what you guys do at Hand to Hold, um, so that they can, they can listen. I had a mom look at me look at me one time and just say, please tell me someone else has gone through this before. Wow. And at that moment, I just wanted to put earbuds in her ear and say, here, here's somebody else who has. Um, and I couldn't do that. So our podcast is really this library now of everything from rare to ear tubes um, of parents sharing their experiences. Through that, I really got um, interested and curious about how Child Life Services technology can come together. And that's where we created Child Life on Call. So uh, right now, our two main services are you can find us on social media and we have free resources and downloads for parents to help them feel empowered during medical experiences. And then my second, who I'll call my third baby, I have two real children, and then I have this app. Um, the app, um, what we're trying to do is expand child life services. So right now in children's hospitals, child life specialists only see about 30% of families who come through. Wow. That's for a variety of reasons. So how can we put these tools, these tips that I've shared with you today in the hands of parents in an app so that they can get to it when they're ready to receive it um, if child life can't come by and see them? So I'm glad that you mentioned that. So certainly this resource for Child Off on Call is available for parents. If you're in a hospital where either a child life specialist is not present or is not available um, or they just can't get to you, how how do you, what do you do as a parent? Like, yeah. how do you go through it? Like, I know you have this resource, but is there someone else that you call? Does your nurse have that information? Like, so for speaking to the parents that may not have that resource available, what do they do? Yeah, I think I would first and foremost ask your your nurse because if you do not have a child life specialist in the NICU, you might have someone throughout the hospital. So we also work in adult settings. We help children of adult patients. So don't lose hope that you actually might have a child life specialist at your hospital and you just haven't consulted for them yet. Um, and so that would be my first step is just asking your nurse to talk to the child life program. The second step for me would be um, going online, looking at a directory. And so you can do that at childlife.org. But we also have private practices in child life specialists in the community, in hospice, in schools. Um, you can DM me on child life on call on Instagram or send me an email and we want to help you get connected to services. So um, please feel free to reach out to your nurse, your hospital specifically, but then come to me or come to another child life specialist in your area and we want to get you connected to services. I love that you have an app. This makes me feel old because it wasn't around when I was in the NICU, but I love that that's a resource now. What's your favorite feature on the app that you think is the most useful? Ooh, I have two that would be my favorite. I know that's, One, I know that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but like which child is my favorite? Um, two, I'll, I'll just go back to the coping plan. We have a plug and play coping plan. So you can choose preferences for your environment. You can choose what you want to do for distraction. And then you choose how you want to follow up afterward. It gets put into a pretty PDF that you can send to your provider before you even go into your clinic or your hospital visit. Awesome. And I love that. Um, the second favorite would be in our notes section, we have two things where we say, these are suggestions for note taking. So we literally walk the parent through how to rate an API note. And what that does, it puts you in kind of the language that nurses are using. So um, you, you know, it's it, it, how you can concretely look at, think at and assess with your child so you can communicate more effectively with the care team. And the other one is questions for the doctor. So when rounds comes along, you feel like you're equipped with at least some questions that you know can help you get to the answer you need. So speaking of rounding, um, I know some NICUs have what we call family-centered care. In other words, like the entire care team rounds, and then others yeah. have traditional rounding where they meet with different people at different times. What do you think is maybe the one or two most important questions that a NICU parent should be asking in rounds, particularly when it relates to their NICU baby? Yeah, good question. Rounds, yeah, it can be a real challenge. In, in our NICU, we had 80 babies and our rounds would take 45 minutes to an hour and a half and we would do family-centered rounds. My job, really, I stayed two or three bays a bit ahead so I could pull the curtain and tell parents like, get ready, they're coming. 
Um, and I don't know it's so much what to ask in rounds, but when to ask it, I would just have the team come up and say, I know if I don't ask this question right now, I'm going to be thinking about it the entire time you talk to me. So can I ask my question first? Um, and then the second thing is to learn the pace of the rounds. A lot of times the care team will go from a head to toe assessment. So if you can get your brain or your mind and your questions kind of in that assessment too, you might be able to participate a little bit better. And when I say head, I think neuro, and then we'll go to swap swallowing, and then we'll talk about pulmonology, and then we'll talk about cardiac. And that's typically how rounds um, go in a lot of different places. I can't guarantee it, but that might be a good way for you to start thinking about what questions you want to ask. That's so good. I don't think I ever, as many rounds as we sat through, I'm not sure yeah. that I realized that that's the sort of the pacing of where they were assessing what he was doing well and what he needed improvement in. Yeah, of course. Well, that makes sense because it feels, sure. and, you know, the systems are all connected too. So sometimes we'll go back and forth, but generally that's how they ha hand off information to one another. So sometimes that can be a key to it. Oh my gosh. I could ask you even more questions. I'm looking at her time <laughs> and I want to be respectful of that. So I always ask, this is sort of the last question that I ask just for everyone listening, Katie's coming back. So this will be the last time that you hear her because I know, I know she's got some good stuff. Um, but I always ask this of my guests whenever um, we finish up the interview is for their advice. So what would be your best advice that you would give to a parent who wants to utilize child life specialists, but they don't know how? Hmm. That's a great question. I think the best way to you utilize child life services um, is first of all, asking for it and making sure you know you're aware of all of your resources in the hospital. So ask for child life, ask for chaplain. They don't just come around, um, you know, when things are hard, they can actually be an incredible support system. And same with social work. A lot of them have um, licenses to do CBT therapy or um, at least can get you connected to someone who does. So I would ask for those three support people when you're in the hospital. But the other best way to utilize child life services is just all of the free information that a lot of child life specialists are giving online. So if you go to social media, type in child life, you'll see a bunch of us on there. And we're, we're just so we now have this new medium to share all of the good tips. So that would be my two ways to get it. Um, both of which hopefully you already have in the hospital, or if you're already discharged, you can find us online and we give as much good and free resources as possible. That was so good. Katie, thank you so much for all your good advice. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, it was another good one, wasn't it? I love talking to child life specialists. I think that they really love and serve our kids in such a unique and profound way that I think benefits our children for years to come. At least that's been our experience. Today's two minute take. Where do I even start with what I loved about what Katie shared? I think if I'm if I'm being a hundred percent honest, I actually think this was the thing that as I listened to her say that, I thought, yep, that makes sense. And what a good practical piece of advice it was when she was talking about when your doctor's round. So whether you're in a family centered care situation or your doctor's round individually, one, you writing down the questions that you have for them. We all know that you should do that. But I think it was her advice of saying, hey, before we get started, these are the questions that I have because I don't, I don't want to forget them because I'm going to hear you say all these things and I'm either going to forget or something's going to happen and maybe they're not going to get answered. I really loved that she advocated one, write them down, but also ask them first. And then whether the doctor can either answer them at that moment or the nurse can answer them at that moment, or they can say, oh yeah, we're going to actually dive into that when we talk to pulmonology or when we talk to cardiology. So, but just being able to say, this is what's weighing on me as the mom. This is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm worried about. This is what I need clarification on. I think it can reframe the conversation. It can reframe the rounds. Um, and certainly if you're in family centered care to say, I as the mama or I as the dad or I as the caregiver, these are the things that I'm most concerned about or that I have the biggest questions on. So let's dive in. And I thought that was exceptional advice. And, and I would expect nothing less from a child life specialist. So 
If you are finding yourself in a hospital that does not have a child life specialist, be sure that you download her app, Child Life on Call. You can go to her website. There are so many resources, her podcast, her blog, um, the starter kit that they have on there is all fabulous. So make sure that you go to Child Life on Call and download that. And it's my hope that this conversation gave you good practical things that you can use today like right now in this moment. And I think that she absolutely delivered. It will not be the last time that I have her on here. So with that, I will see y'all next time. Thanks y'all for listening to NICU Babies Parent Support. Every parent and every experience is welcome here. If you are a NICU parent and you're finding yourself in need of support, please download our app. You can find it in the Apple Store or on Google Play, Hand to Hold. And if you love today's episode, you can share it, you can subscribe, and you can most certainly review it. We would love, love, love your reviews. It's how we reach more NICU parents. Thanks, and I'll see y'all next time.